I've got a massive dose of imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. And if you know what that is, imposter syndrome is that little voice in the back of your head that's saying, you can't do this. Why are you trying to do an Ironman? Like yeah. this doesn't mean, why are you trying to be a fighter pilot? Why are you trying to go to the Air Force Academy? This is for the other guy. You know, this is, you didn't put in the effort. This is not something that you're capable of doing. I don't know if that's how loud that voice is in, every, is in everybody's head, but it, I think it exists to some extent for everybody. And the reason I call that a bit of a superpower is because I've observed that in, in successful people since then. I've seen that a lot of successful people have a really strong nagging sense of self-doubt in the background, mm -hmm. but, and this is the important caveat, it has to be coupled with a growth mindset. If I just have that nagging sense of self-doubt, well, then I'm just going to try to hide that from you forever. And I, you know, I'm going to try to trick you because I'm never going to be good enough. And I believe that voice and, and I'm going to fake it. But if I have a growth mindset that says I'm not good enough today, I couldn't go run an Ironman. I have no reason to believe that I should be able to. But if I have a growth mindset and follow the path and patterns that others have laid out before me and put pieces of other patterns together and map, create my own map, then I can pursue that and stay disciplined against it and be successful. The only way we can pick the right things to pursue, knowing that we're, we are going to accomplish less than we think we will in the short term, but we can accomplish more in the long term if we're aspirational, is instead of picking the mission based off of what we think we should do right now, because if we have that conversation, there's a hundred things we could yeah, or right. should do right now. Yeah. Let's figure out where we want to be in three years and then work backwards from that destination three years from now and not just the bumper sticker don't just tell me what your mission statement is i want to know what does your workforce look like in three years what is your competitive advantage what are your principles what is uh the markets you're going to compete in what are the customers going to look like what are the partners going to look like describe that in exquisite detail give me the blueprint for your dream home and then we'll back into how we're going to lay the foundation this mm -hmm. quarter or put in the driveway mm -hmm. and that way we're not trying to do everything at once we're working backwards from that blueprint so my dad had a job where he worked four days on, four days off. He was a leader at a manufacturing plant uh, in charge of uh, the plant. He's a plant manager uh, at it. And uh, what it allowed him to do is he, in these old manufacturing jobs, you get to spend 50% of your time there, 50% of your time off, meant for longer days. And so 50% of the time we had a dinner table where everybody was around the table and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and got to see each other. And uh, the other 50% was kind of just figure it out on your own. And, you know, mom would make dinner. Sometimes we'd still eat with mom, but, um, but other times we'd, we'd do it, you know, based on sports and stuff uh, on our own those days. But we tried to get together whenever dad was there um, with the entire family at the table. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. But did you, did you um, have any type of entrepreneurial tendencies growing up at all? Were you, did you like, you know, sell candy or anything like that? Or did that not hit until after, you know, the whole military career and all of that? Yeah, I would say not really. I, I'd say um, certainly not entrepreneurial in the sense that, you know, starting businesses or anything in, in high school or even had my eyes on that. Matter of fact, I probably went the opposite route. If entrepreneurial is breaking glass and, and going in different directions that people have got, never gone before, I went down the most structured, well-worn yeah. well path in history, you know, and that's the military. Um, but, uh, but that also served me well as a foundation for future entrepreneurship. Yeah. Yeah. And talk a little bit about, you know, that foundation that you did develop there at the military. What types of things were you involved with and, and doing? And when I was reading your bio, I kind of had, you know, Top Gun kept on, you know, going through the back of my head. So, so yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious to hear all of the things that you uh, had your hands in there. Yeah. Well, it was just beach volleyball all the time. That's all. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Not really, but uh, so so the military was great at providing kind of the blocking and tackling. So as you think about as you you venture into entrepreneurship, um, you're falling back on a skill set and and uh, you know obviously intuition and vision and all those things are critical. Mm -hmm. But in terms of turning that into action, uh, I think that the military was great from that perspective. It put me in an uncomfortable place, which was uh, a freshman at the Air Force Academy, where you go through a hazing year and basic training. As, as soon as your senior year in high school ends, you go right to basic training and you, you're just enduring a lot of um, painful moments, whether physically or at one of the, the hardest schools in the nation, intellectually, I'm being challenged in the tests or socially um, because I'm being yelled at all the time. Mm -hmm. And so right, under the, right out of the bat, you're, you're in a sandbox environment where the suffering is 
really inconsequential, meaning it doesn't really have real world consequences for you, but you get to figure out how to build grit and perseverance and, and, and principles and discipline in order to endure it. And so I, mm -hmm. I think that's critical for when you leave that sandbox and you go into other environments where now we do have consequences that you can fall back on those moments. Yeah, no, that's, that's an interesting, uh, you know, that's an interesting take on that. What, what were some of the, I guess, maybe the, the things that you went into the military that you really felt yourself change or really felt a shift in your mindset or the way that you would approach things. Are there anything, is there anything that sort of comes to mind as far as, you know, wow, that was, you know, I would have gone a completely different direction, you know, when I, before I got into the military and now it's, this is the clear path to, to move forward with. It was um, conformity to a structured, well-tread path for success. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think it, it reminds me of all the all these speeches that we hear at high school graduations where the the person up on stage, you can almost write the speech because you know what they're going to say. They're going to say, you can do anything. The sky's the limit. And you need to go follow your dreams and all this and all this stuff. And, and I think that's a little dangerous to tell mm -hmm. kids. It implies that they have it within them to go find those things. It's not that they don't have the dream or the vision. Sure, they, they, they hopefully they have that. But the, the question is, do they have the path to pursue it? Do they have mentors in their life that are gonna mm -hmm. guide them down that? Is there a structured way to, to go pursue this dream? And so for me, the big epiphany and what really changed for me was when I went into pilot training. I graduated from the Air Force Academy and I'm 22 years old and I went right into pilot training. And now I'm flying faster than the speed of sound uh, mm -hmm. with eight of my closest friends, three feet away from each other. And in this moment, I had the same epiphany that most pilots do. And that is, there's no reason this should be me doing this. Like mm -hmm. if, you, if you went and looked at a lineup of kids in high school and said, who's gonna go fly a $50 million machine faster than the speed of sound um, in five years, you wouldn't have said that guy's gonna do it. And so if it wasn't about me, if it wasn't the clay that was being molded, but rather the molding that was taking place, then, then what was special about those circumstances, it was the structured path by which this system spit me out mm -hmm. with these capabilities and expertise that I never could have developed on my own. And so when I go back to the, connecting this to how does this, how does this build the foundation for success? It's about finding systems that make us better and not trying to reinvent the wheel and, and, and you know, telling kids you're, the sky's the limit, go follow your dreams. Oh, I think that's terrible planning for, you know, setting them up for failure and disappointment. There, you know, for every Mark Zuckerberg who is successful along that path, there's a million others that fall yeah. on their faces and don't know why. Yeah. And, and that's, that's really, I, I, I like that insight. And I'm, I'm curious to hear if you would, um, when you're, when you're in, uh, you know, flight school and you're, you're going down this path of, you know, this, this structured regimented, um, you know, training molding as as you called it was there a tendency to say you know why don't we do it this way or let's do it this this other way Were, was there like deviation or or you know things that you were trying to inject into the into the mix or was that um was that sort of shied away from and you know no this has been the proven path that has been done many 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 times before i'm, I'm curious to to hear your take on that as, as far as you know again adding your own sort of flair element whatever thoughts into that into that situation great question and so and so what it you know what it really taps into is is this so structured that we're stifling creativity and that we're not creating an environment where we can share insights and the answer is definitely no so even though it's heavily structured even though there's a clear path in front of me and a and a you know a process that i have to follow in order to be successful they built this learning mentality in the culture that's so pervasive that it's in every mission that we flew. And I'll give you an example. So after every time we flew, we'd come back and do a debrief. And the debrief wasn't just for me, and although most of the comments were for me as a, as a student, and they'd tell me what I needed to do better the next time, they would then turn the conversation around and say, did you see me deviate from any of the, you know, the standards of flight today? And, and what did I do wrong? And, and what are the things that you captured? And they're honestly asking it. They're not, they're not saying like, tell me how great I am. They want to know like, what did I miss? What are the blind spots for me? And how can we do this better the next time? Now, chances are pretty low that I'm gonna come up with some, you know, super enlightening thought for this pilot training process that's been taking place for 40 years, but, we still have the conversation. And once in a while we do get a great insight, but more importantly, 
if I make an input, I then get feedback as to why I can approach that differently or maybe I missed something in my assessment and it makes me smarter for having the conversation. And so yeah. we don't shy away from, from having that learning moment for everyone. It's not about who's right, it's about what's right. Yeah, and, and I love that you sort of made the tie into having mentors you know, in the beginning yeah. because you know they've, they've walked it before and I was just was curious to see how the military handles you know, that, that creative side that, you know, everyone wants to try to input into and, you know, reinvent the wheel, I guess you could say. So, um, so, so talk a little bit about some of the things that you did during the military, your military career. I mean, you, you've had, you had quite the, the long career. Um, so talk about some of those high points and then we'll get into what you're, what you're up to today. Sure. So I spent 15 years as a pilot, um, flew during most of those years and, uh, and only had one year off for, for medical issues. And uh, I, during that time frame, I, I flew 2,500 missions, most of those as an instructor. My airframes were, were from training aircraft as I'm training new pilots uh, to the F-15, uh, which is an air dominance aircraft that only does dog fighting like Top Gun, exactly yeah. like Top Gun. And as our only mission, uh, we didn't carry bombs, we just carried missiles uh, to, to fight other airplanes and, uh, and, and loved every minute of it. It was, it was just an incredible experience. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really amazing. Um, so, so when you got out of the military, did you jump right into afterburner or is there anything else that you did, you know, sort of leading up to that? So for me, it, I probably wasn't going to leave the military. In other words, I really was kind of coasting in my comfort zone at about the 10 year point and flying had stopped becoming very difficult. It's not that I had completely mastered it, but yeah. it's like driving a car at some point, you know, you, you can still learn, but it's not like every day you go out and you're nervous about it. You, you can, you can find yourself lost in thought while you're still moving your hands and feet, driving the car. Same thing with flying, same thing with a mm -hmm. fighter plane. And so something shook me out of that mentality. And that was a cancer diagnosis in 2010. And so I wouldn't have probably changed chapters or changed um, my profession had it not been for that. Cancer diagnosis, stage four, 15% chance to live. Life expectancy wow. is 18 months. And, you know, all the, all the nightmarish, you know, things that go along with that. Sure. And, uh, and that kind of shook me out of my, my comfort zone, um, of course, you know, just with facing a disease. But then also on top of that saying, gosh, there's so much else I kind of would have liked to have accomplished in life. And beyond knowing that I was going to die in 18 months, the kind of the big aha moment for me was that my facing my mortality at all, that I'm going to die, period. And that yeah. even if I hadn't gotten this diagnosis, I probably wouldn't have done that much else with my life because I was going to do 20 years in the military and then not much time to reinvent yourself at that point yeah. and go in another direction. And so I committed. Your question was, how did that, how did I decide to do this? I was on, no, was I in business? Not at all. It was this wake up moment, this shake you and wake up moment of having cancer where I said, I probably won't get a second chance, you know, if the doctors are right. But if I did, mm -hmm. I'm going to do things very differently and I'm going to try something new. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you went in and, and, uh, uh, ran an Ironman, was it? as well i did yeah yeah so that was yeah that was a couple of years later that was on the five-year anniversary the doctors told me to expect to live 18 months i lived quarter by quarter you know i'd plan out the next quarter and then i'd have a doctor's appointment every quarter and uh they'd say you're good now you'll most likely get bad news next time so go live your life for the next quarter and then at about the two-year point we got to lift that horizon to a year and as i'm approaching the five-year anniversary i'm saying i might actually get some life out of this and get a chance mm -hmm. to, to live beyond what they've said uh, and so I decided to, uh, you know, go, go for something that, uh, meant something to, to, to that mark that anniversary. And so I decided to go do an Ironman triathlon, mm -hmm. never ran a marathon. My last bike said Huffy on it and it was yeah. bright yellow and, mm -hmm. uh, and I wasn't a good swimmer. So <laughs> we'll see how that plan is. <laughs> yeah. And, and was it, did it, uh, was it successful? Did you complete it? And yeah. Wow. Impressive. I did. You know, and once again, it's a testimony to process and to structure mm -hmm. because I did the exact same thing that I did as I became a pilot. I found mentors that had done this already. And mm -hmm. I said, this is going to be crazy. I know you're going to tell me to go from a marathon to a small triathlon to an Ironman, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to, I put a date on the calendar. It's in about eight months. I'm going to do an Ironman. If mm -hmm. you were me, what would you do? And I said, well, first of all, you are crazy, but here's how you can train. <laughs> Here's the bike you need to get. Here's what you need to do every day. Here's the training program. Here's what you need to start eating. And then you just execute the process. And yeah. so it, even though it looked visionary in terms of like doing something radically different in my life, 
I was falling back on patterns for success from others. Yeah. And, and were you, would you say that you're in reasonably good shape when you started this or is it, uh, you know, where you you had to build yourself back up again? I wasn't sure how much the, the illness had taken out of you. It, it had taken a lot out of me. I did massive surgery and they took part or all of four organs from my abdomen wow. and did, uh, you know, almost a year of, of chemo. And so my hair turned silver and a lot of it fell, fell out and I was really skinny, but I was, I, I, even through all of this, I worked out. Mm-hmm. It was almost my only respite from, from being sick is that I got to go sweat a little bit and sweat the chemo out because chemo yeah. is like poison and I didn't want that in my body. Yeah. Um, and so I stayed in relatively good shape. Still not somebody that should probably go run an Ironman, but yeah, you know, relatively good shape. That's, that's amazing. And you, so you, you went and, and trained for that in a period of eight months. So, you know, obviously you've got a, uh, a very, very, strict mindset, I guess you can say, or a very, very strong mindset. You know, when you, when you put your, your head head to something that, you know, this is what I'm going to accomplish, you know, you, you, you persevere through whatever issues may present themselves. Um, Do you have any tips, I guess you can say for people that are in situations that they feel like, you know, I don't know if I can do this, you know, how do you keep going when you don't like, I'm sure you probably said, I don't know if I can do this Ironman thing at a dozen times when you're doing all the training and all that, any, anything come to mind as far as, you know, like, you know, just keep going, you know, what, what, what are your thoughts along that line? Yeah, I, I think it's a, a very in, intuitive question. And, uh, I'd tell you that what I have is a bit of a superpower and it's going to surprise you when I, when I claim that what that superpower is, I've got a massive dose of imposter syndrome. Mm-hmm. And if you know what that is, imposter syndrome is that little voice in the back of your head that's saying, you can't do this. Why are you trying to do an Ironman? Like, yeah. this doesn't make, why are you trying to be a fighter pilot? Why are you trying to go to the Air Force Academy? This is for the other guy. You know, this is, you didn't put in the effort. This is not something that you're capable of doing. I don't know if that's how loud that voice is in, every, is in everybody's head, but it, I think it exists to some extent for everybody. And the reason I call that a bit of a superpower is because I've observed that in, in successful people since then. I've seen that a lot of successful people have a really strong nagging sense of self-doubt in the background, mm-hmm. but, and this is the important caveat, it has to be coupled with a growth mindset. If I just have that nagging sense of self-doubt, well, then I'm just going to try to hide that from you forever. And I, you know, I'm going to try to trick you because I'm never going to be good enough. And I believe that voice and, and I'm going to fake it. But if I have a growth mindset that says, I'm not good enough today, I couldn't go run an Ironman. I have no reason to believe that I should be able to. But if I have a growth mindset and follow the path and patterns that others have laid out before me and put pieces of other patterns together and map, create my own map, then I can pursue that and stay disciplined against it and be successful. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Again, following following that path, following the the mentors and and such. So so what happened? You know, you 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 ran the the Ironman or you competed in the Ironman. Um, what happened next? When did Afterburner come into into the mix? So Afterburner was uh, around the exact same time as the Ironman. I, I joined Afterburner in 2014. And Afterburner was already in existence. I didn't found the company. It was founded in 1996 by somebody who had a similar epiphany. In his words, he went from farm boy to fighter pilot and exact same thing. He said, how did I become this guy on the other side Mm -hmm. of it? Because I was not the guy. And, uh, And he said, this system, whatever this was that just transformed me and created an elite team out of the shabby individuals that walked in the door in pilot training, if I could bottle that, we can change the world. And so he did. He created this methodology and process to recreate elite teams uh, and and create that growth mindset. And once again, that path uh, for organizations. And of course, that deeply resonated with me. And I knew about the company before I left the military. And so this this was the logical place for me to go. And I just joined as a consultant in 2013, 14 Mm timeframe and uh, you know started at the bottom within the company. Yeah. And and so Afterburner has worked with many, many different types of organizations. I mean, NFL, what are some of the other things or some of the other organizations or industries maybe that they've even worked with? So 14 um, NFL teams, as you alluded to, and uh, twice it was the team that won the Super Bowl that year. And, uh, and, and probably most notably was the New York Giants when they beat the Patriots. They were four and four and Coach Coughlin called up our founder and said, uh, I just read your book. I'd really like to instill some of these concepts. And so they went from four and four to us following them along for the rest of their season until they had their hands on the Lombardi trophy at the, at the end of the season and beat the Patriots and Tom yeah, Brady yeah. in the process. Yeah. 
And, uh, and then all across every industry, we've worked with uh, 80% of the Fortune 500, but where we consistently get pulled back into is high growth tech. And I believe it's because there's a lot of similarities. It's you know very high stakes. Uh, it's explosive uh, market. It's things moving faster than the speed of sound, just like they were in my world. And there's also a lot of distractions. And so it requires extreme focus and alignment in order to be successful. Mm -hmm. and, and what are some of the 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 techniques that you use to you know align these teams i guess is the best way to be able to to, to phrase that the process is in intentionally very very simple matt and that and that was the way we approach things as fighter pilots because out of my 350 instruments in the cockpit i had to only pay attention to two or three at a time and i had to know which two or three to look at it had to be a simple process when the world's going by at twice the speed of sound in order for me to be successful well, when the market is being created in front of you and you have to move very quickly, you have to have that simple process as well. And so we always flowed in a, the following format. We plan very inclusively and put everybody's fingerprints on it, whether that's 25 allied nations in the military that are building the plan or it's you know with the, your partners uh, in business. We brief the plan so that we show the group that we're going to go execute this. This is not going to be one of the 20 things we said we're going to do. Mm -hmm. We're briefing it. It's product launch time. Here we go. We execute during execution. The collaboration is way down intentionally. And a lot of teams miss that. You're not supposed to collaborate during execution. You're not supposed to stop communication, but I don't want to reopen planning and have long winded mm -hmm. two hour meetings. Every time we get together, just execute the plan. Tell me what pop up threats are occurring. And then I'm going to give your voice back in the debrief. Because we're going to do that debrief, just like I did when I was a pilot and going yeah. through pilot training. Let's talk about what we can do better. And now here we take the rank off. It's not about the senior vice president or the CEO uh, being right. It's about figuring out how we do this better the next time. Mm -hmm. And and how often does that debrief happen? You know, and, and I guess how long is the uh, the deployment or the you know the the uh, the execution of you know that that particular strategy? Or plan. We typically tell teams in high growth tech to pick a horizon for what we call missions in a six to eight week increment. And okay. the reason we pick that is because if you go over eight weeks, then the world is so volatile, especially in high growth tech, that is going to change to the extent where the plan is going to look so different at the end of this. It'll be tough to debrief. We've deviated so much that you know it, it didn't really make that much sense to plan against all of that change. Yeah. If you go less than six weeks, now we're saying it's not really enough time to make an impact. I don't want to plan, you know, for my mission tomorrow and get everybody together and have this conversation. The juice has got to be worth the squeeze. And so we find that a, a, a good time frame is about six to eight weeks. Mm -hmm. And and the six to eight week time frame, how do you choose what that plan is? Because obviously, you know, I mean, you could say I want to dominate the world and that, that's not going to happen in six to eight weeks. So how do you how do you make sure that you have a a, a, a an achievable target that you know is stretching yourself enough to be able to make it like you said you know enough juice in the squeeze there um you know stretching far enough far enough but not so far that it's going to be unachievable yeah you're asking all the right questions because you know the, the something for people to acknowledge is that we often underestimate what we can do in three to five years mm -hmm. but we overestimate what we can do in three to five months and so your question at the end of the day is really about, well, how do you pick what you're going to do? Management is doing things right. It's just getting that mission right. Leadership is doing the right things and picking those things. And the only way we can pick the right things to pursue, knowing that we're, we are gonna accomplish less than we think we will in the short term, but we can accomplish more in the long term if we're aspirational, is instead of picking the mission based off of what we think we should do right now, because if we have that conversation, there's a hundred things we could yeah, or right. should do right now. Yeah. Let's figure out where we want to be in three years and then work backwards from that destination. Three years from now, and not just the bumper sticker. Don't just tell me what your mission statement is. I want to know what does your workforce look like in three years? What is your competitive advantage? What are your principles? What is uh, the market you're going to compete in? What are the customers going to look like? What are the partners going to look like? Describe that in exquisite detail. Give me the blueprint for your dream home. And then we'll back into how we're going to lay the foundation this mm -hmm. quarter or put in the driveway. Mm -hmm. And that way, we're not trying to do everything at once. We're working backwards from that blueprint. Yeah, that makes sense. Have you ever heard of uh, like Scrum methodology, Scrum oh, development? Yeah. yeah. Very it, familiar. It, I mean, it kind of 
kind of sort of seems similar to that, but, you know, longer, you know, usually the sprints are normally about two weeks or so, but, you know, so obviously you're, you're a little bit longer. Is that, is that how some of these methods get deployed where they're still running them through a scrum methodology and, you know, then you're still doing that or, or do you sort of, you know, scrum is a, a different, a different process that wouldn't necessarily be combined with, with this methodology. Scrum is phenomenal for engineers. I know Scrum very well, and it, and it works very well with the engineer mindset. What do I need to accomplish today? Can I take a backlog and just pick something yeah. from it that I'm going to go pursue? And, and that's perfect for engineers. And, and, and what we'll do is we, we will build the umbrella of missions and campaigns for them to then build sprints. And, okay. and so underneath that, they'll build their sprints. Where I think Scrum falls a little bit is they don't necessarily look at the long-term picture because they would say it's not worth it to look at the long-term picture. That was our old waterfall planning. And whenever we do that, we would make mistakes. So it's not even worth it to expand on the horizon. I think that's a, I think it's a misstep. I think it's an overstep um, from the world we left, which you know they were right initially that it was way too rigid and structured, but they, they took it too far in the other direction and said, we're only gonna plan things in two week increments. Yeah, yeah, and then I, I guess on the measuring uh, on your your side of things, right? You know, so with Scrum, you have your velocity. You figure out, you know, we're doing so much, you know, so much a week, so many points a week, or whatever it is. Um, how do you know if you're on track to be able to meet your target? You know, throughout that process, you know, we're, we're behind, we're ahead. You know, how do you how do you guys track or measure that? So we have clear measurements for that three-year horizon, our destination. And we're mm -hmm. going to talk about, from a workforce perspective, tell me literally measurements that you're going to define your workforce by. Um, and, you know, the, for the, from a financial perspective, it's very easy to define, you know, what is the revenue going to look like, the ARR, if you're becoming a SaaS company. Um, what are the bookings going to have to be? What are the partner-led selling that's taking place? And define all of that. That's three years, and then we're gonna back that into, if that's the marathon, if that's mile 26, where do we wanna be this year at mile 10? And so we'll have them define what success looks like this year as well. And from that, we'll carve out our missions and be able to build the, this, the incremental steps to go pursue it. So we're measuring the entire way around what's gonna take place. Yeah, that, that's cool, that's very cool. Is this, would you say that, there, that this would work in pretty well any industry, any vertical? Um, or are there certain verticals that it seems to work a little bit, you know, a little bit better on? Like, or, or, or actually, maybe even phrasing that better is: Are there certain characteristics that a company would need to have in order to be able to, you know, successfully deploy this? This probably wouldn't work very well if you're, you know, a, a five-man shop, and obviously you're doing this with very, very large companies or organizations. But you know, are there certain characteristics that people would say, okay, yes, this is something that you know could be a, an option for us? So I do believe that it scales and adds value everywhere to the extent where I even use it with my family. So my family has a destination where we want to be in three years. My son's going to graduate high school in four years. And so he has, you know, his, where he'd like to go to college and uh, what our world's going to look like. And, and our mission is to be the place where our family wants to come back to at all times. And we're defining, you know, what it's going to take for that to, for us to earn that from our kids mm -hmm. as, as they start leaving in, in a couple of years. And then we work backwards into what does that imply we need to do this year and how do we invest in each other right now? And so it, it definitely scales and cascades, I, I think, into every aspect of life where if you were to ask, you know, where, where does it have the most impact? I think that for high growth tech teams in particular, there are so many opportunities and, you know, they're they're not lacking for paths. They're drowning in paths. Right. right. So it's about picking the right paths. And because of that, our methodology is great to give them focus, particularly in this remotely dispersed environment we find ourselves in. Mm -hmm. We work with tech teams constantly that are just paralyzed, smartest people on the planet. They all went to Harvard and Stanford and they're just brilliant people. But the challenge is they're a team of champions. They're not a championship team. It's yeah. difficult to create that championship team as we're staring into Zoom cameras and creating relationships and massive turnover and employees. And so this is a bit of a superpower behind the scenes to build that alignment for these groups. Yeah, I, yeah, I really, I really like that. And is there, is there uh, like relationship building? Is that sort of part of this too? Because obviously, you know, like you said, when you're flying, you know, three feet away from your best friends, you know, you've built that relationship personally, you know, over a period of time, you know, I would imagine that there's, there's a certain element to this as well that helps foster, you know, that relationship, which then, you know, you, you, you feel, you know, connected to, to that person next to you. I'm going to do ever, whatever I can to be able to help them make sure that they're successful. Their success is going to be my success. 
you know, does that does that factor into this as well? Absolutely. So, you know, The Speed of Trust is a great book um, that talks about how trust is the, the lubricant for any, any success engine. And, and I totally agree with that. And we can create a lot of trust by building the long term vision for success, what we're going to accomplish this year, what we have to do these next six weeks. We hold each other accountable to that. So from a team perspective, we start to build professional trust with one another. And that's a great thing, especially in this environment. Now, I, I know you're going to do what you said you're going to do. I'm accountable for that. We're not going to do it perfectly. There's no perfect yeah. mission and we'll debrief it and talk about how to do it better. But I'm building professional trust with you. On the other side of that coin, on a social or personal level, I think one of the missed opportunities by a lot of companies right now is to invest in the team members on an individual basis too. I was talking to a, uh, the president of a, a huge $10 billion revenue organization in tech yesterday. And he, I said, you know, what are the things you're, you need to do better? And he said, here's where I, he said, I'm told I'm too tactical. I'm spending too much time on, you know, trying to track down why that expense took place. And, and I need to get my head out of the tactics and, and look at the strategy. And so he said, that's where, I'm, that's where I'm making my transition now to be a better leader. He said, but I can't be tactical enough with the relationships with my people. Mm -hmm. And I love that statement. He was, he was basically saying that that doesn't go towards the one-on-one -on -one conversations. I was having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with him. He gave me an hour of his time yesterday. And he said, those are critical. I have to invest in people and have these one-on-one -on -one conversations. And, and that is strategic. That's never, that's never something to, you know, to take off of your to-do list. And I think we're losing that a little bit. And, and I've learned that lesson with my team. It's, it's something that uh, I didn't do perfectly during the last 18 months. And, and even though we have a great rapport, we, it's something that I've had to invest in more heavily over the last six months. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I feel like not only the, the last, you know, 18 months because of what we've just gone through, but I feel like that was, that's sort of a, a direction that a lot of people are going anyway, just because of technology, right? It's, it's a lot easier to send a text message and, you know, no real voice or personality behind it than, you know, picking up the phone and calling people. And, and I think that a lot of people, you know, sort of get stuck in that trap where, you know, that's the method that they prefer, which then, like you said, you lose up that, that whole other side of it. Yeah. In, interesting. Um, what, uh, what's next for you guys? What's next for Afterburner? What's on, what's on Afterburner's, um, you know, roadmap or, or mission? So two really interesting pivots that we made during the pandemic. Uh, we're, we're very much an in-person consulting agency. And so as you can imagine, all of our in-person events and consulting were just turned off in Q2 mm -hmm. of 2020. And so we had to say, all right, you know, let's look at this optimistically. If this was the best thing that ever happened to us, what pivot did we make during this time period for even greater success on the other side of the pandemic? Mm -hmm. And, and what we aligned on was two things. One, we have to have a much greater digital and virtual component. And so we worked on it. We built studios and I'm in my basement right now and I got a studio set up and, yeah. and we have that like a lot of people had to and, uh, and got really smart on production value in this environment and, uh, and, and built software and built a digital component to everything we do. And we had to do that anyway. And there's, there's a, my favorite book on the new environment. I don't know how they write these books so quickly, but uh, it's called Post Corona. Okay. And one of the th things the author contends is that uh, coronavirus did not destroy or create new markets. It mm -hmm. only accelerated what was already taking place. Yep. And I thought that's really insightful. It, it, and when I thought about it, I had to agree. So it accelerated the fact that we knew we needed to have a bigger digital component, but we could put some time, you know, kick the can down the road on that. We couldn't anymore. So we built that out and, and that's been really successful. And the second thing we did was we said, if we're going to build this from, you know, from, from this point into a post pandemic environment, what resources would we deploy in a different direction? And so we said, what if we switched from just being consultants, to actually owning the companies and the outcomes that we're making. And so we started a private equity play for that as well, raising money and buying companies and uh, using a thesis and an operating model that we've been talking about this entire podcast to transform companies that we own and that we have a stake in as well. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, that's amazing. Wait, so what types of companies are you looking at, at investing in? So specifically, it's, it, this might be interesting because I'm going to go off of the path that I've talked about the entire time, not high growth tech, uh -huh. uh, more of the blue collar type companies, sure. uh, the, you know, the, the tried and true value companies that are out there. 
Uh, a lot of baby boomers exiting the market right now mm -hmm. who own companies and, and there's an opportunity um, to pick those up. Not really strong succession plans uh, for those organizations because a lot of the, the kids of, the, of, of those baby boomer founders don't necessarily want to own their dad's printing company. Yeah, and uh, yeah. you know they want to go work at Facebook or just get the check from this. And so um, this this exiting pressure is creating some um, some opportunities to pick these companies up and, and transform them. And then what we are excited about is I, I always want to do things from a why perspective. Having cancer, you know, taught me that for the rest of my life, it's not going to be just about creating economic value. I have to have a sense of connection to it from an inspiration piece as well. And I love the thought that we're saving some of these companies that would mm -hmm. probably be dissected and sold for parts. And we're going to come in, we're going to transform it operationally. We're going to give the next level of ownership and, and tier of management access to their legacy and teach them how to do it and build it back better. And it's been really successful uh, so far to transform these companies. Oh, I love that. I love that. Yeah, that's that's actually uh, something that we're very interested in as well is, is you know, uh, acquiring those those boring businesses is what you know a lot of people uh, call them. So, uh, you know, but but you're absolutely right. I mean, there's there's so much so much uh, such a reach that you can have with that because that you know there's so many people that are employed there that've been employed there for many many years, and you know that would that would all uh, go away if it wasn't for you know people like you who are coming along and and looking to to invest in those. So. That's fantastic. That's and I, I love the whole business model rolling into Afterburner into that, um, you know, into that acquisition process. That fantastic, fantastic. Um, Joel, if people want to learn more about you, your your processes, your systems, um, what would be the best way to reach out and get in touch? So I, I'm really prolific on LinkedIn. I'm not big on Twitter. I have an account. You can follow me, but you're probably not going to hear much from me. Uh, LinkedIn, though, we share our stories there and our insights, our team insights, and our lessons learned um, on a weekly basis. And so if you want to follow some of our progress, see where, where we're at in the world, we're getting ready to head to Silicon Valley in three days and spend a week there and then heading to Chicago and Denver the next week. And we always share the insights from uh, these experiences with our LinkedIn community. So follow me, connect with me, send me messages. I read them all and I answer them all because once again this is about connecting with people and investing in other people is never a tactical investment mm -hmm. and so that's the first place you can go to our website afterburner.com to learn more about us and then we've got a learning experience program if you want to actually go through the training and get some digital training on this and watch videos on this process then uh, you, you can go check that out at afterburner.com as well very cool very cool yeah you've you, like I said I, I knew this was gonna be an interesting conversation you've had quite the life congratulations and all the success and uh, great mindset. And, and I, I love what you guys are ushering into in the future as well. So kudos to you. Congrats. Thanks, Matt. I enjoyed the conversation today.